Good morning and welcome. Thank you all for coming. Today we're here with the Director, Strategy Plans and Policy in International Affairs, Major General William Zana, and he will discuss the State Partnership Program's 30th Anniversary Conference happening here in the National Capital Region 17 and 18 July. I'm Captain John Ledoux, National Guard Bureau of Public Affairs, and I'll be moderating today's media roundtable. We will have 30 minutes today, so I'd ask that you please keep your questions focused on the topic of the State Partnership Program and its anniversary events. General Zana has a brief opening statement, and then we'll open it up for questions. And to ensure we have time for everyone to participate, we will limit everyone to one question and a follow-up. And then if there's additional time at the end, we'll open it up for additional questions. I have a list of the media joining us remotely, and we'll call on you by name. And I know some of you in the room, but not everyone. Um, so if you're in the room and I call on you, please uh, announce your name and your outlet before asking your question. And with that, I will turn it over to General Zana for his opening remarks. General. Thanks, Captain Ledoux, John, and, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the 30th anniversary of the State Partnership Program, a program that began in 1993 with just 13 countries and has now grown to 100 countries. The program's growth and evol evolution as we look at this is truly just quite remarkable. Today's National Guard is a ready, capable, and vital part of our national defense strategy. The importance of allies and partners is a theme that runs deeply through our national security strategy our national defense strategy, our national military strategy. And I'd argue is deeply encultured within what we do as the U.S. military, how we operate uh, in our values. The SPP is a program that clearly demonstrates our nation's enduring emphasis on working side by side with willing partners. The State Partnership Program provides an unparalleled opportunity where we, the National Guard, in close cooperation with both DOD, Department of State, and our uh, both nation and state partners, build enduring and trusting relationships with partner nations, around the world. The Guard's currently partnered with more than half of the world's nations, and we expect to see continued growth in the coming years. We've got capacity within the Guard to be able to support additional partnerships and additional missions, training, opportunities, and exercises. As many of you know, the National Guard State Partnership Program will celebrate our 30 years of building and growing these successful long-term relationships with allies and partners in a conference scheduled for next week, July 17th and 18th, at the Gaylord National Convention Center National Harbor uh, here in Maryland. At this event, we'll host approximately 600 participants from more than 90 nations, uh, with many ministers of defense, chiefs of defense, ambassadors, combatant command commanders, state adjutants general, senior enlisted leaders, and a variety of speakers uh, and panelists from across our whole of government, including the White House, uh, Department of Defense, and Department of State. It's, it's truly a remarkable turnout for this. At the conference, we'll commemorate the program's many achievements, but I think more importantly, we're going to focus on sharing discussion uh, to help shape the program's future, the evolution as we go forward. An event of this magnitude is unprecedented in the program's history, and it's going to provide us an opportunity to do at the highest level what the program does every day worldwide, and that's to share, learn, and grow with one another. We invite you to RSVP uh, to one or more of the 30th anniversary conference events. The agenda is available and will be shared with you. Invited speakers include Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Mark Milley, our JCS member, General Daniel Hokinson, Chief National Guard Bureau, many other high-ranking U.S. and foreign defense officials. We hope you will join us, and thanks again for your interest uh, in this vitally important program. I look forward to some questions and discussion. Thank you, General Zana. I will now open it up for questions here in the room. I will start with John with Defense Scoop. Thank you. Uh, thanks for doing this, General. Thanks. I was wondering uh, to what extent cyber uh, plays a, a role in this program, and are you looking to expand any of those initiatives with some of these partner nations? Hey John, thanks for the question on cyber. What we see, uh, there are a lot of, um, if you look over the history of the program, you see an evolution of the things that we really focus on in training. Uh, cyber information operations has been something that's emergent. There's a great demand signal for. Uh, one of the breakout sessions or one of the uh, panel discussions that we've got during the uh, event is focused specifically on cyber. We see a great demand signal uh, from our partners to, to grow the capabilities. We face many of the same challenges, um, both in terms of adversaries and in terms of the efforts that we put at this. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've seen a tremendous growth of the number of things that we do, both exchanges, exercises, and events. Uh, they're either related to the state partnership program or more broadly what uh, we do with the, within the Guard with our partners in security cooperation. I see uh, continued growth in that in other areas. Uh, one of the other areas that we see a lot of discussion on, um, and I think it's driven by what many people are seeing in the news, uh, unmanned aerial systems. Uh, we see uh, tremendous interest in space activities and operations as well. 
Uh, we also see growth and I think opportunities within uh, areas like women, peace, and security. I think there's a number of, um, of our partners uh, who we have both shared with and are learning from in terms of best practices across all those areas. Thank you. I was wondering, does this program uh, play at all into the so-called hunt forward operations that Cybercom does? Is, is the Guard part of that and is it at all connected to this program or is that a totally separate thing? Totally separate thing, but what I would say is uh, within the, the state partnership program, you've got, um, it's a mill to mill relationship initially, but really that's just the opening of the door uh, to all sorts of other activities. Um, we see that uh, often the, the trust that's built within these relationships helps us uh, to partner in many different ways with, with partners. Thanks. Okay, we'll take our next question virtually. We'll go to Phil Stewart with Reuters. Hey there. Um, I know you're focused on the state partnership program. Uh, I, my questions are, are related to Taiwan. Wondering, uh, you know, how uh, how how easily uh, you know you would be able to incorporate Taiwan into the state partnership program. What challenges uh, you would face in doing so? Hawaii has been cited as a possible uh, state to do that. Um, and also, could you bring us up to speed on on where uh, guard uh, training is with the with the Taiwanese uh, right now, and what kind of cooperation exists? Thanks. Phil, thanks for the questions. And what I would say first off, uh, the focus for today is strictly on state partnership program. Taiwan is not, um, uh, there have been discussions uh, about admission there. The process that we work with uh, every nation is that there has to be a request from the nation. Um, this is worked closely with Department of State representatives. Uh, it comes back to DOD and there's a partnership that occurs and a dialogue at every step of the way. It would be premature to talk about anything with Taiwan. Uh, we have other nations that we partner with that are outside of the state partnership program uh, every day, and we've got relationships that uh, have more recently come into the program. An example would be uh, with Norway and Minnesota, a partnership that existed not within the realm of the state partnership uh, program, but with uh, combined operations and exercises over 50 years and just formalized last year. Thanks, Phil. We'll take another one virtually. We will go to Chris Gordon with Air and Space Forces Magazine. Hi, thank you, sir, for doing this. Um, I just, as you look forward for the next 30 years of uh, state partnership programs, um, is there gonna be an increasing role uh, to train partner nation um, air forces? And uh, uh, to allude to John's point earlier, um, is there any uh, plan to conduct some space training as well um, with partner nations? Chris, thanks for the, the question. And first, to, to lead off about the, the part for 30 years, one of the things we often talk about is we reach this very important milestone of 100 countries at, at 30 years. There was no goal for us to, to get to that. It's just kind of how the, the program has evolved. As we look forward, uh, one of the things that I talk about in the future is we don't expect the next 30 years to simply be adding another 100 countries and slap the table and, and we're done. We look at really the evolution of, of the relevance uh, and the uh, the focus areas of, of training and partnership with, with all the different nations. What I would say is uh, while some of the initial um, partnerships featured a lot more uh, activity that were associated with land forces over the arc of the program in the last 30 years, we see a tremendous increase in the partnerings uh, across Air Force and Air Guard. Uh, and I think uh, we just expect that to, to continue. Uh, Further, and this goes uh, back to John's questions, we absolutely see a demand signal from our partners um, and an opportunity to work with them much more closely on space. We see that uh, at scale and at different levels, different nations are either directly involved in some of the things that, um, uh, that they want to do for their own interests in terms of space or that uh, other nations, in some cases adversaries, have an interest in their capabilities. Um, so it's a great opportunity for us to both learn grow and, and share with partners. And I think that access and influence is a very important part of the program. Thanks. Are there any questions here in the room? Jim? Hi, sir. Good to see you again. Great to see you, Jim. Um, you know, I, they're, they're, I haven't spoken to a combatant commander who hasn't praised the state, state partnership program to the heavens. I mean, they, they believe it's a, it's a very good expenditure of funds. Um, and they want more. Is there any way to speed up the process? And I'm thinking specifically in these, um, uh, you know, 
commands like Africa Command or uh, or in, in some of the island nations of, uh, of Indo-Pacific Command. Any way to speed that process up? Is that a problem with just uh, the process or is that is that a problem that you now are getting sort of limited with who you can uh, add? Uh, Jim, great to see you again. And, and thanks for the question. I could spend probably an hour just on this and expanding, but I'm gonna focus on a, a couple of aspects of it. Um, we benefit. Um, by the interest and the support from the combatant commanders, the service component commands. One of the great things about the program, my job, is uh, everyone wants more of this, and the participants, both when you look at this down at the tactical level, the soldiers and the airmen who are involved in this every day, uh, up to our most senior leaders, they recognize the value uh, in the return on investment. Uh, that return on investment piece, one of the metrics they often share, it's 1% of the nation's security cooperation budget results in 20 to 30 percent of the touch points or engagements that combatant commands have. So they inherently see that value and the, the multipliers that go with that. Um, when we look at uh, this demand signal for both more partnerships, which is one aspect of it, but also more resources to go towards the partnerships that we have, it's, uh, it's kind of a multi-pronged thing that we've got to work. Uh, the first part in terms of the um, of the year-to-year addition of nations. This past year was, uh, was unprecedented in adding five nations, unprecedented since the beginning of the program. But it was the right time and the right fit. And as we looked at the cooperation with the Department of State and Department of Defense, it just made sense to do that. We normally would look at adding just a couple of partners a year, look across the globe at which nations have requested it. Uh, that's a, a key part of it. Which nations are ready to embark on this? And we see um, kind of a, an emergence of uh, many other nations who probably wouldn't have had an interest 20 years ago who have a keen interest now. Look no further than what's going on in Ukraine uh, in Russia. We see great interest from our Nordic partners and other uh, partners in Europe, uh, enduring interest from Africa. And having spent two of the last four years on, on continent Africa, I saw the manifestation of how important those programs were to many of, uh, of the smaller nations that we deal with, when I say smaller in terms of their overall capacity or defense budget. The other part to your question that I'd like to, to just engage on, um, we're limited only by, by resources and, and imaginations. Uh, oftentimes, some of the most creative uh, activities and the things that happen with the program are an expansion beyond mill to mill or the creativity that goes with our soldiers, airmen, and their counterparts from other countries. Uh, that said, there are limitations with the funding of the program. The funding processes that we have, it's about a $50 million program. We've often um, relied uh, very largely each year on congressional ads. That, that's great, and we appreciate that support from the Hill. The reality is getting this into base budgets uh, is something that would normalize the processes and allow us, especially when we're operating under continuing resolution, a better planning uh, horizon working with our partners. When you think about what it takes for a state or territory or district within the U.S. to coordinate through a combatant command with a foreign partner, the, just the admin and logistics of that to make it happen, it's a challenge. Uh, and we make it very difficult. We look at nearly 100% execution of, uh, of funds last year. It's just because of those efforts. Uh, that said, with shortfalls in budget uh, this year, we've got hundreds of events that we've either had to cancel or postpone. And these are all events that are very much aligned with our national defense strategy and very much aligned with our partners and our combatant commands theater strategies. And from my viewpoint, one of the things I, I often cite, uh, you have so many stakeholders in this program, but all of the stakeholders see the richness and the goodness of this. You can almost draw a Venn diagram of what a, a nation partner wants to do, kind of plot those points, what a chief of mission and ambassador his or her staff uh, want to do in terms of their focus, look at what a combatant command wants to do, look at our strategy and look at the capabilities within the guard. All those things come together in a little bit of a sweet spot where you then target what is it that builds the most readiness within our formations uh, and how do we leverage that in working with our partners. The fact that it can adjust uh, year to year event to event exercise to exercise, that dynamic part is, is important. Uh, I'd suggest that if we had full funding from the services and that those congressional ads, and again, we appreciate that support, are focused on those things that are emergent to the combatant commanders within a year of execution. We look at what's going on within Ukraine right now and supporting our partners who are supporting that fight. This is a vital way that the program got 30 years of trusted relationships and partnerships that go back 
to all the countries that are most directly involved in this. Uh, recent discussions with our Polish counterparts, our Romanian counterparts, our Ukrainian counterparts. It's just you see the uh, the importance of the program. So uh, additional, um, I think, um, the, the resources having a, a process that we can uh, we can depend on a little bit more soundly year to year is helpful. And then continued measure growth, and I think that goes in partnership again with the Department of State and Department of Defense. Thanks, Jim. And if I could just add Please. further a little bit, you. 30 years, some of you, some of you guys have grown up with your partners. I mean, that has to, that has to be worth something there alone. Yeah, so one of the keys that I see, and I've, I've been uh, the person who's gone into different nations or worked on different exercises and events where it's a short duration partnership and both sides of this, you still want, you, you bring goodwill uh, to that, but it's not the same as having um, a relationship that has endured over many, many years where you, you, know, you exchange information outside of this. Families know one another. You've broken bread uh, on both sides of an ocean. Uh, that trust, uh, you, you can't build that overnight. Uh, those seeds that are planted, um, I think it's something that is, we as, uh, as United States military particularly good at and our partners are really good at. Uh, the other piece is that if you look across the forces, there are so many soldiers and airmen on uh, both the U.S. side and our, our counterpart side who have only known an existence, a context for their military service in which they had a partnership. So they look back, and this is as much a part, it's kind of the lore or the legacy within units, that they hear this from the people who went before them. They hear stories uh, about the events that they did, the challenges in training, uh, the, the shared aspect of this. We wouldn't have realized when the uh, program first started that it would then years later result in co-deployments, um, forces from the National Guard deploying in harm's way and losing service members alongside partners. The richness of those connections, it, it can't, be, can't be overstated, and it's one of those things that I think has made the, the program um, both, uh, both popular in, in this enduring enthusiasm for it. Thanks. Let's take another virtual question, and we'll go to Carla Babb with Voices of America. Hey, General Carla Babb with VOA. Um, thanks for doing this. I just want to follow up on what you said about Ukraine. Can you talk about how the spillover from the war in Ukraine has affected the California partnership, for example, and not just that partnership, but the partnership um, with the with the surrounding countries like Moldova, like Poland, like R Romania? Carla, I appreciate the question. I think this has been one of the things that has really brought uh, for many people, the, the state partnership program into the news and into, uh, into the vision of, of folks who may have otherwise not realized the, the depth and the breadth of the relationships. So in advance of uh, Russia's uh, invasion of, of Ukraine, um, we were doing close partnerships, not just with, the, um, with California and Ukraine. One of the things we often refer to is uh, you marry one state, but you get the whole family with the guard. So when there is a capability that doesn't exist within one guard, Army Guard or Air Guard within a state, we reach across the 54 states, territories, and district to be able to get additional resources or capability. This sort of dynamic shift really plays well to being able to support our partners' needs, uh, demands, and expectations in real time. We've got some flexibility that's built in by scaling this across the 54. In advance of Russia's invasion, uh, we were working closely, and if you think about some of the things that uh, have been, I think, uh, sources of great success and Ukraine's success uh, in defending itself against this uh, unjust, illegal invasion. Um, you see the, the manifestation of that on, on the battlefield. Uh, some examples of that that I would cite that I think are very important. The emphasis that we place on, um, on unit and tactical level leadership uh, driven by non-commissioned officers, NCOs, and enlisted professional development. Uh, that culture within the U.S. military and within many of our partners and allies is not something that is, uh, has been a, an aspect or a strength within all countries, and I think it's something that we've shared. If you look at the small unit uh, tactics and, and success within Ukraine, I think part of that is attributed back uh, to much of the work that was done between Ukraine, uh, California, and other partners in the region. I'd also say that when we look at the uh, the U.S. focus on building readiness and capabilities and the building blocks, how we, we manage training, whether this be Army or Air, of 
uh, individual, lower level collective in building that. I think uh, you can see the evidence that Ukraine has leveraged this to great effect uh, against Russian uh, forces. Similarly, I think uh, that this has really supercharged the effort for the neighbor nations there, both in advance of the invasion and certainly afterwards. We see a, a galvanizing of the relationships in NATO, and I think a galvanizing in the support um, across the state partnership program. One of the things that the state partnership uh, program brings to the combatant commanders and DOD writ large is a connection of not just these bilateral relationships, but multilateral relationships. I say the multilateral because often if there is a um, combatant command exercise or event or a service component command uh, event, the state partnership becomes a multiplier to, to bringing in additional partners and players from other nations who may have otherwise not been a part of that. The richness of growing those capabilities then, I think it manifests in, in growth and capabilities on, on all sides. Uh, one of the examples they often use, um, and this is indirectly related to what we're talking about, we have a small state, uh, Vermont, that has three state partners. Their oldest, North Macedonia, now celebrating 30 years. A uh, 15 year old relationship with the nation of Senegal in Africa, and the first year relationship with Austria. Seeing now the interaction between those three nations, some of that which occurs completely out of the, the realm of what we do with state partnership becomes a multiplier for each of those partners, and we definitely see that uh, in Eastern Europe. Carla, thanks for the question. Do we have any uh, questions here in the room or follow ups? Okay, John. Thanks. Uh, just a quick follow-up. Uh, with regard to Ukraine, um, has the partnership program been paused essentially since the Russian invasion? Or are you providing any assistance, you know, remotely? And then uh, just kind of looking ahead, you know, long-term assistance to Ukraine has been a big topic of discussion at the ongoing NATO summit. Um, are you looking to expand uh, that relationship in the future, specifically through this program or just through the Guard? writ large in terms of uh, improving Ukraine's kind of long-term uh, security posture. Yeah, sure, John. I'll, I'll take that in two parts. Um, first off, we've continued uh, to do training and support both for Ukraine and, and other partners. Uh, obviously, things have had to shift uh, to areas where we could do that training safely. And I think um, as we look at equipment that's been fielded in support of Ukraine's efforts, and not just equipment, but capabilities that, that are needed to grow uh, to support both the fight and then the support from nations where we're helping with um, everything from logistics training all the things that it takes to to bring the capability to bear on the battlefield that has continued uh, and will continue there i think the um, to me it seems that there will be a growth in the demand signal from our partners in a number of ways first off our partners have um, paid a tremendous uh, price in supporting and providing equipment uh, much of the equipment that they had uh, that um, was not uh, obviously backfilled or they didn't have ready backfills for uh, types and pieces of equipment, uh, that is going to have to be, uh, that demand signal is going to have to be met. Uh, so I think there will be new equipment, that there will be uh, an opportunity. Uh, the Guard, uh, Army and Air uh, do an exceptional job of doing new equipment training and new equipment fielding. It's kind of a bread and butter for something that happens across the 54 every day. And it's a logical expansion to help our partners uh, as they field replacement equipment uh, and train up in that. And I think the two-way street aspect of it, we always look at this as being kind of a shoulder to shoulder. We learn from our partners and they learn from us. We share best practices. And I think this is an opportunity um, as we look to the future and hopefully um, at, at some point peace in the region that there will be a reset that's needed for all the militaries who've done so much to support Ukraine and indeed with Ukraine themselves. And I think uh, we'll be, you know, postured to be able to support that, working very closely with the combatant commander and across the department. Thanks, John. We have time for one more question. Uh, we have a virtual one in the queue. Uh, we will go to Gina Cavallero with Army Magazine. Thank you. Um, thanks, General Zana, for doing this. Um, you said there were five nations added in the last year, and that, that was uh, the most, uh, a, a big year or adding nations. What do you see in the coming year or the coming five years? And could you also, um, I guess in closing, um, for the uninitiated, uh, uh, make a statement about why the National Guard is the right uh, way for this program to continue? Thank you. 
Thanks for the question. Um, so first off, uh, this year, the way things worked out to add, we'll have three African partners. Uh, Malawi and Zambia will be a combined partnership, and we're currently evaluating the applications uh, from multiple states who wish to, uh, to uh, be a part of that. Uh, Gabon, another African nation, which will be added. We added both Samoa uh, to an existing partnership with um, uh, with Nevada and then Norway and Minnesota. I mentioned the formalization of this partnership that's existed for 50 years. As you look to the future, I think um, we look at uh, the capacity to expand the program as being a couple of nations a year. And I purposely don't uh, put a specific number on it because it's dependent upon both what uh, the nation's request, the combatant commanders and Department of State support, and then it is relying on funding. We don't want to spread ourselves so thin that we're not able to uh, have the depth of the, of the training, operations, exercise, and exchanges that, that each of these partners deserve. And our, uh, the evolution of this, I think, is going to continue. There will be some years where there will be uh, a slightly larger and a slightly no less number. So I think over the, the five years, um, we'll see that evolve. The, the second part, you know, I think the Guard is, is just uniquely suited to this program, and there's a lot of different ways you can look at that. Uh, first off, uh, citizen soldiers, uh, this whole idea of, of having both civilian capabilities, a connection back to state and community, and a community-based force. A lot of times with our partners, this is, um, this is a more approachable or an easier construct um, for them to engage with. You often find that we have civilian skill sets across the Guard. This is true for the rest of the reserve components in security cooperation. But the Guard really excels at this, those civilian skills which then translate to something that you can do on the ground. An example that I provided uh, for a couple of years deployed uh, in Africa, I saw there were often things that were asked for by our partners that weren't uh, necessarily uh, strictly a military capability, but there was a civilian experience set that we could bring to bear to help the partner in that. So often as we start with a mill-to-mill -mill, uh, engagement, that expands into the whole of government. And the whole of government part is really, I, I describe it as the special sauce for the, uh, for the program. You start having things like municipalities working um, as sister cities and towns with one another. You look at state government doing engagements. We've had many foreign partners visiting uh, their states, uh, and similarly, governors and uh, officials from states going to their state partners, uh, academic to academic, think tank to think tank, uh, economic uh, first responder, all of these things add a richness to this whole of government experience that I think the Guard's uniquely suited to, to fill. Uh, when we see the very best of the programs, they're the programs that expand into this space in a way that is authentic to both the capabilities and needs of both the state and the nation. There's just this richness in this relationship that occurs. And then it's where the imaginations go. And typically, um, these things are, are not things that, um, that we're funding from the Department of Defense. They're, they're a bonus that starts building trust and, and confidence and deepening those roots. When I look at some of the pairings, and I saw this uh, both in, in uh, deployments uh, within the CENTCOM, uh, UCOM AOR, and, and with AFRICOM AOR, you see that there are um, relationships between a state and a nation that start building um, an understanding that our nations and our states uh, have so much in common in terms of their desire for having peace and security, opportunities for prosperity, the opportunities to, um, to educate and, and have safety for families. When we get folks together from both sides of this equation, we often see that uh, we're far more alike and we have so much in shared values. Uh, that is one of those things that really goes to building trust and I think um, building a, a warmth that exists in, in so many of these relationships. It's just something that the Guard does well and our nation partners really respond well to. Thanks for the question, Gene. All right, thank you, General, and thank you to all those in the room and online for joining us today. Please feel free to send additional questions to the National Guard Bureau Media Desk and we will follow up on those and any taken questions as soon as possible. Thank you.